right. Hello, everyone. Happy Friday, and welcome to the Henry Schein Dental Academy webinar series. My name is Adam, Marketing Specialist, and I will be your moderator. Today, we're welcoming Dr. Casey Bennett as our speaker as he discusses how to overcome perceived barriers around getting started with CAD CAM, as well as how to ramp up your production. At any point during the webinar, if you have questions, please type it into the Q&A section of your control panel, and we'll answer live at the end as we have time. Henry Schein is not offering CE credit for viewing or attending this presentation live or on demand. And this webinar is sponsored by Plan Mecca. So with that, I will throw it over to you. All right, how's it going everyone? Happy Friday. Just a little about me. Uh, I went to Clemson University, went to MUSC. Uh, I currently work as an associate at Teeth Dentist and Specialist right here in Charleston. Uh, I teach at MUSC, teach CAD CAM one day a week with the dental students. Uh, that is super, super fun to be able to share that with them. And I am currently a faculty at the Mod Institute that is opening um, this fall. So just, you know, full disclosure, I'm receiving an honorarium from Henry Schein for this webinar. And with that, let us get started. So I'd like to kind of start by talking about same day indirect restoration workflow and scheduling, because that's a, you know, a big concern of a lot of people is how do I be productive? It takes X amount of time to go ahead and do a same day crown and I could be seeing other patients. So I'm going to kind of show that. Uh, talk about one of the major benefits to me and for the patient is conservative preparation design. Uh, we're going to get into digital impressions, the design software, milling these restorations, characterizing them, making them look really pretty bonding protocols, uh, delivering them, and then just return on investment because this is a really, really good investment. Um, then we'll end it with some cases I've done and just kind of show the potential and power that uh, the Plan Mill 30S and the Emerald S scanner has. So the Emacs crown appointment, it says 90 minutes. I usually schedule two hours. Uh, the fastest I've ever done one is an hour and a half. And that's when everything goes according to plan and you are cooking it. Uh, but typically, you know, the first five to 10 minutes, you can go ahead and get the patient numb. Uh, the biggest saving of time is how quickly you can prepare that tooth. Uh, so being efficient in that department will, will minimize the amount of time. Uh, taking the impression doesn't take very long. Designing doesn't take very long. I'm going to show you a video of me actually real time designing one of these crowns and how simple it is. Uh, milling it out doesn't take very long either. The Plan Mill 30S is very quick. In my opinion, uh, it'll mill out a premolar in eight minutes. That's pretty fantastic. That's using Emacs. When you try these restorations in, uh, minimal adjustments, if any. Typically, I don't have to make any adjustments, which is fantastic. Uh, then glazing it and firing it, that's another chunk of time. And again, downtime, I'm going to show you how to optimize that downtime. Uh, then you deliver it and clean it up, take a final radiograph, make sure everything looks good. Uh, the trickier ones, I will schedule three hours, or if I'm doing more than one unit, I'll schedule more time. But like I said, two hours is typically enough time to get this appointment done and not go over anywhere else. So a sample schedule, uh, this would be a very, very busy day. Uh, but it's also a fantastic day. So if I could get my front desk to schedule this for me every day, that would be great. Um, patient comes in at eight o'clock for their same day crown. Uh, you can go ahead and get them numb, then jump over into your hygiene exam. Uh, typically, you know, I'll get the tooth prepped, scanned, everything ready to go and sent to the mill before that limited exam comes in. Or if the limited exam does come in, uh, my second assistant will go ahead and seat them, take the x-ray, find the chief complaint, that kind of thing. So timing wise, you know, you have some fluidity, uh, go ahead and, and while it's milling or any of that downtime, I can go and see that limited exam, finish that crown. Uh, then, you know, I could throw some restorative in there and just take a break or, you know, it gives some flexibility. If I don't finish exactly at 10 AM, it's, it's okay. Uh, start another crown procedure at 11. And again, that first 40 minute, 45 minutes, 40 minutes is critical to not really be scheduled anywhere else because that way it gives you time to prepare the tooth and go ahead and scan it and get it sent to the mill. But uh, 
I want to show you this because in the afternoon, I get, you know, I'm doing two restorations. And so that takes a all afternoon, but I could jump out and have my other assistant kind of help with filling in the gaps. Just in the CAD CAM column, column only using our fee schedule, that's $6,341 that, that I'm producing. And that same day, I don't have to bring the patient back to deliver, no temporaries, anything like that. And I'm also in the, in the low production column, able to produce uh, over $1,500 in, you know, just filling in the day and delivering different things than different cases that need to deliver. So combined, I mean, that's an almost an $8,000 day for you. And it's super, super productive. Uh, it's just fantastic when you can, when you can schedule like this, not, not every day is always scheduled like this, but uh, if you can do some block scheduling and, and try and train your your front desk to schedule appropriately, these types of days days uh, kind of become more frequent. Again, happier patients because there's no temporaries. You only have to anesthetize, anesthetize the patient once, which is really really good. Uh, patients are happy because they don't have to come back. They really really love being able to just get their crown in the same day. Uh, and then when you optimize downtime with other patients and you really fill your schedule in, it makes you a happier, more productive uh, dentist. One of my favorite things about adopting this technology is how conservative you can be with how you prepare these teeth. One thing that a patient will never get back is the enamel that, that they work really hard to make. Uh, so using cat cam dentistry lets you just take away only the, the damaged portion of the tooth and replace that. So here's some preparation styles that I've done and, and frequently use. Just kind of wanted to go over those because uh, you can prep a little bit differently. You're not, not having to take the finish line all the way down to the gum line. Uh, you can make these really aesthetic restorations by preserving a lot of that enamel. And one that I do very frequently, I don't think I've done a, a conventional crown unless I'm removing an existing one uh, in the past four years. I just, I just don't prep like that. Uh, and I, I'm not worried about temporaries staying on or, or falling off or anything like that. And I'm, I'm really confident in my bonding protocol. Uh, so I haven't had any experience of these really falling off or breaking. And if you've ever had to remove one for one reason or another, it makes you really believe in, in the bond and adhesive dentistry. So with this, I'm preserving all of this enamel. You can just see in that very conservative preparation design, there's a lot of really, really good enamel to bond to, and that restoration is going to be locked on. I'm keeping it at the height of contour, which aesthetically, you know, you might be worried about shade matching and things, but once you get really good at picking out the shade and working with, I particularly work with Emacs a lot, uh, it, it becomes second nature. So here it is with the trine in the purple state. Again, I didn't really have to adjust this restoration at all. And there it is delivered. You cannot even see the margin. You can't see where the tooth ends and the restoration begins. I really like this because it's cleansable. When the patient brushes their teeth, they're brushing right at that interface. Uh, so it's, yeah, it's just a fantastic restoration. There's that, where that margin is. This patient in particular, it's kind of funny. Um, after I delivered this, they came back uh, for you know subsequent appointment and said, you know, I really don't like that crown that you did. And I was like, really? And they pointed to number three. And I was like, and we did number four, not number three. And so that's just, you know, she didn't even know what tooth we worked on because that's how well they blend. Singulum preservation prep. So anterior crowns, uh, again, preserving that enamel. That's, that's kind of my, my focus. And so here's a case that I did. You know, the patient had some old composites, recurrent decay, and just kind of, she wanted something that was more aesthetic. She didn't like her front teeth. And you could see all of that enamel on that lingual that I saved to bond to. And there it is in the purple state, trying it in. Minimal adjustments, if any, I, I rarely have to adjust these, which is just incredible. And that saves a lot of time too. And there they are delivered. And just a very natural aesthetic result. You can achieve that same day. This appointment took me three hours uh, and that's moving at a leisurely pace, seeing other patients at the same time. You can have really fantastic, beautiful results. I was able to take photographs of everything too. So another thing about preparing teeth conservatively is that it opens up kind of a, a bunch of restorations that you can provide to your patients between that 
composite and that full coverage crown. So you're actually adding more tools to your tool belt. Uh, this is a, a perfect example. This tooth was actually a treatment plan by another dentist for a full coverage crown. And I see what they were talking about when I saw this tooth. We got a leaking restoration. Uh, we have some craze lines. We have a mesial marginal ridge kind of crack going on, a lingual uh, crack, a distal marginal ridge crack. That's a, an unsupported distal lingual cusp. And radiographically, there was mesial and distal decay. So to really take care of this tooth and make it strong, if you're doing a filling, it turns into an MODBL composite and you're probably replacing that distal lingual cusp because you don't want that unsupported enamel. And that's a, a very large composite restoration uh, and kind of becomes more difficult to do too. So actually when I saw this, I decided to do a, an onlay and here's what the tooth looked like after I prepared it. So I incorporated that distal lingual cusp I went ahead and got rid of the mesial and distal decay. Uh, I chased that buckle uh, crack a little bit. It did extend into the dentin uh, after I removed that amalgam. And here it is after the purple state, trying it in. And these restorations just fit like a glove. They, they, they fit so well. And when you deliver them, again, choosing the right shade, choosing the right translucency, they blend in. You can't really tell where tooth begins and restoration begins. You could do aesthetic cases with this. I, I do routinely do all of my anterior crowns and veneers. And uh, this is a three quarter veneer prep case. I just kind of wanted to show you this design. So these are some existing veneers the patient didn't like and went ahead and prepared the teeth and just a three quarter veneer prep. I don't know if y'all have ever prepared teeth like this, but you're preserving that whole natural lingual. And I chose, you know, it, there were existing three quarter veneers on here, but it really helps you if you have a black triangle and you're trying to eliminate that, you go sub gingival on those interproximals and it lets you have that proper emergence of the restoration to kind of fill in that black triangle. So here is the restorations with the trine in the purple state. And there is the delivery. We did have some, uh, papilla damage that occurred. And so this is a week after. And I'm uh, just letting biology biology do its thing and have that papilla grow back in. But uh, overall, uh, the patient was very happy. We got a very natural aesthetic result. And she was, she was ecstatic. And we actually did this one all same day. So I blocked off my entire schedule. And all I saw was this patient, it was a Friday. And we started with a design, a proposal that she approved of and went forward from there and was able to mill these. I actually put her in some temporaries and she went shopping and uh, came back to the office after all the milling was done, tried it in the purple state and then fired everything. And she kind of hung out while we did that. And then we delivered them and uh, we were done same day, which is fantastic. So digital impressions. Why do you need this? If you're still taking PVS impressions, uh, why should you change to digital impressions? So scanners, in my opinion, have come a very long way. When I first started practicing uh, with CAT CAM dentistry, I was using a plan scan, which is a fantastic scanner for quadrant dentistry. A little trickier if you're doing full arch scanning. And I did eventually figure out how to do that, but it took me about five, anywhere from five to 10 minutes per arch to actually do that successfully. Uh, not exactly efficient, um, but again, a great scanner and, and I, let me really do some fantastic CAD CAM dentistry. It's just scanners have come a long way. And this Emerald S scanner is, uh, it, I, I mean, I'm almost speechless with it. It's, uh, it's a fantastic scanner. It is super, super fast. Um, it's lightweight. Uh, it's super easy to handle and hold. Uh, it's super precise. Uh, very accurate. I actually do, uh, you know, big long span bridges with it. I do removable. I've done some immediate dentures with it. It's really easy to take those files that it scans with uh, and export them as you need. Uh, it's easy to import files that you receive from labs. It's just a very diverse, uh, good, hardy scanner that, that will provide all of your uh, digital impression needs. Another thing that's really cool about it is it has two different tips. 
It has a regular size tip that is actually still pretty small when you compare it to a lot of scanners on the market. And then it has this slim tip, which is super, super tiny. Uh, and I don't use it, the slim tip for everything. I, I do when it fits, I like the regular size scan tip just because it has a really good field of view and it, and it does a good job at picking up a lot of the, the data. Uh, the slim tip is a little bit smaller of a view, so, um, but it really works with those patients that can't open very wide. Uh, any of those patients that have a really, really small mouth or tight little spots, it gets in there. And so between these two tips, you could scan every single patient, every single patient. So why are digital impressions beneficial? Uh, first off, it's, it's just more comfortable for patients. Uh, when you tell them, hey, you know, I'm going to take an impression and you start scanning and they're like, wait, after it's done, where was the goop? I didn't get all that goop. What are you talking about? And, you know, patients hate the goop. Okay. <laughs> Open <laughs> wide. All right, now bite down. And, no, oh, okay. <laughs> We've all been there. Your nose, just breathe through your nose. So patient comfort is huge. Uh, another good thing about taking digital impressions is it is decreased lab costs. A lot of labs, you know, if you send a digital impression, they have kind of a digital rate versus the conventional rate. So a little workflow conventionally, here's the dentist, you know, I take a PVS impression and I have to ship it off. So I send it to the lab. And most modern labs nowadays are actually taking that impression, pouring it up in stone, and then scanning it in and digitizing it themselves to design this restoration. So then they design the restoration on the computer, they mill it out, and then they send it back to you. So that's, you know, if you're taking PVS impressions nowadays, a lot of labs, most labs are, are digitizing it anyway. So why not cut out a step, go ahead and just scan it in, send it to the lab. They don't have to scan it. So it eliminates that step. They already have it digitized and they could go ahead straight to designing that restoration and then sending it back to you. Now, better yet, if you're thinking about getting into CAD cam, go ahead and scan it, design it yourself, mill it out yourself. And then you get to deliver it same day. And that creates very, very happy patients. Patients are always so impressed that I don't have to come back. They, it, 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 they've been doing that for me since I've been practicing dentistry with CAD CAM. And it doesn't get old. Decreased error. So just want to kind of talk about uh, the accuracy and the trueness, the precision. So most single unit restorations, you are having that impression taken with a triple tray. And triple trays have a big discrepancy depending on uh, how rigid that impression tray is. So the metal ones, yeah, they're going to be more accurate. They have less discrepancy, but the super flexible ones, they kind of will introduce a lot of distortions and, you know, 50 to 210 micron discrepancy. That's, that's pretty big. So you can have a lot of error just introduced from taking a triple tray impression, especially with a flexible tray. With digital impressions, you could just go in and, and, Look at look it up. Uh, do a PubMed search and look at some meta analysis or systemic reviews. And the bottom line is is that these scanners, especially the new ones that are on the market today, are accurate. They just are. They're as accurate as PVS, if not uh, more accurate. And so, when you're looking at these studies and, and kind of looking it up, you have to just you know they're going to throw out words like trueness and precision and accuracy. Uh, just know that trueness. You know, a lot of these studies they'll have some type of master scan file. And then they compare all the scanners to that. And uh, that's the trueness. And then the accuracy is, is the combination of the precision of that scanner. How, how many times can it do that and get that result? Uh, and, and how true is it? So, so just, just some terminology for when you're reading these studies. There was one done by uh, my colleagues at MUSC. And you know, one concern that a lot of people have is you know, the scanner can't scan all substrates that shiny gold crown, it's not gonna be able to pick it up accurately. Well, this study kind of showed that, well, it does, you know, across all substrates, whether it's gold, zirconia, amalgam, uh, enamel, dentin, blue core buildup, white core buildup, they thought of everything to kind of throw in there, different composites. And uh, what they found was that uh, they're remarkably accurate. 
the new generation of scanners, you know, on all substrates for complete arch scanning. And then there was another uh, study that was done, uh, came out about a year ago, uh, again, by my colleagues at MUSC. And it just showed that the scanners have incredible cross arch uh, accuracy. And they're, they're super, super accurate. And the Emerald S is, is right there. It's one of the most accurate ones. There's no real statistical difference between any of those top scanners. And one thing in this chart I want to point out, the, the Emerald S uh, beta version versus the Emerald S production version, you can see that they've done things and tweaked things to just make this scanner more accurate. And, and Plan Mecca continually does that with software updates. Uh, so the scanner is just going to get better and better, easier and easier to use. Uh, and they, they continually update that. There's another study done where, um, again, my colleagues, they took a, a, an actual maxilla from a cadaver and they scanned that and um, basically found out that digital impression systems uh, were able to accurately replicate the tissues of the complete arch, um, which is fantastic. So I already mentioned that I use this scanner to do removable. And when I tell you that the frameworks that I do for partial dentures just slide right in, they just slide right in. It's, it's really awesome. And the soft tissue tracking on these scanners is, is right, it's right there. So I've even done some edentulous arches uh, and it's pretty incredible. So I throw this in there just so, you know, if you're into hybrids or doing anything like that and you want to start incorporating digital workflows, you can now scan those arches and, and know that it's reliable to start, you know, combining with CBCTs and fabricating implant guides and, and knowing that the procedures are going to kind of move forward as planned. Uh, there's, there's little error that's introduced by doing a digital impression. And again, shorter lab turnaround time since you're not, you know, taking the, the time to ship it out and actually have the physical impression sent there. You're just able to send it through secure uh, platforms, you know, Dropbox and, and HIPAA compliant platforms and communicate with your labs and instantly send them. And so they can just download them. That's just turnaround time is, is less. So I've done a couple, you know, I don't mill out my own bridges, but I'll send the, the digital impression to the lab. And, uh, you know, a week later or a week and a half later, I have the final product ready to deliver. So that, that is another added benefit. With digital impressions, uh, I will say there is a learning curve. When it comes to scanning full arch, you do have a scan pattern that you need to follow. So I did a little video of myself scanning actually my front desk. Uh, she was a nice, just a uh, sample patient for me. And she has all of her teeth, all 32. Uh, I just used an Optrigate and I had no assistant helping me. I was able to just scan this and this is real time. So here we go, I chose non-restorative. And I go in and I start scanning. And the scan pattern I like to follow is I like starting with the occlusal and kind of oriented towards the lingual. And then after that first pass, the second pass, I will go and start incorporating more of the, le the lingual and try and get uh, some of those embrasures. I'm not super worried about getting every detail in these passes. And then this is the key one right here is where I kind of get the incisal and start to incorporate the buckle but I'm not doing a full buckle because what I'm doing is I'm giving the software data points to stitch together. So I'm, I'm not just blindly starting from one end to another. It's able to see spots that I already scanned and then know exactly where it is. It just kind of helps it orient things and accurately stitch things together. So now I'm doing that true buckle pass and trying to get some of that buckle vestibule. Um, trying to get all the little embrasures. This next part, you'll see this little blue square kind of at the bottom that lights up and then it kind of un, you know, goes away. That's me pressing the active delete button on the scanner while I'm scanning. So any unwanted data that I do not want to capture, I'm going and pressing that button. You can see it pop on and off. It's eliminating that from the scan and letting the computer know I don't want that to be in my final model. And so now I'm going to come around and just for, for fun, I'm, I'm going to get the soft tissue. I mentioned how awesome the scanner is at soft tissue tracking. And it's going, it's going all the way into the palette and it's accurately gathering that data. Uh, and so I'm able to get the, the hard palette. You can even, I mean, 
I kind of stopped a little short because my uh, front desk was saying that it was it was a little too much. But uh, you can you can capture all of that. And so now I you know I'm stopped and it's going to process and and use different algorithms to take all that data you just acquired and come up with a really accurate 3D model. And so I always check it. I check the data density, make sure that I have good density. And so now I'm doing the lower arch and I sped this up like crazy just because I didn't want you guys to sit here and just watch me scanning forever. Um, but again, I want you to look at the bottom it only took a minute and 40 seconds per arch. Uh, and that's me kind of taking my time. Uh, I could probably do it a little quicker, but a very accurate lower arch. Now we're going to get the bite registration. I like doing a bilateral bite. This is the first bite and it's stitched in eight seconds. So, I mean, it just clicked in right away. On the second bite, it didn't stitch in as quickly, which is kind of good for this example. I just spent like 30 seconds, then I finally gave up when it wasn't stitching in. You can manually take that bite registration and, and drop your models into it, and then it will align it. So no worries if it doesn't automatically stitch in. It normally does, but I'm kind of glad it didn't uh, for the sake of this video to show you that you can go ahead and, and manually do it. So now that we are masters of scanning and you're not worried about scanning anymore and you know that you know, you're know you gonna be able to master that very easily, let's move into the design aspect. Cause that's a lot of, a lot of times dentists are, are worried about manipulating. They've never used CAD software before. Uh, they're worried about the design aspect of it. It's gonna take me too long to design these crowns uh, and it's just not worth it for me to learn this skill. Well, practice does make perfect, and I'm, I'm not going to say that it's uh, going to happen overnight, but uh, you can take a, a model and you could practice on the model if you prep the tooth on the model and just get your speed up. It, it'll happen faster than you think it will. So here's an example of me designing a crown. This is one that I did with one of my patients, um, I guess it was a couple of weeks ago, and I just decided to you know screenshot and record it. Uh, so here it is. This is real time. I think it takes like six minutes, but I'm going to go through and just describe to you everything I'm using. So first off, I'm going to go ahead and put it into the, the color view mode. And I, it, it automatically kind of defaults to trace. And it's, a, it's good to just go ahead and you just click along where your finish line should be, where your crown margin is. And it doesn't have to be perfect. I wouldn't spend too much time worrying about it if it's not perfect because you're going to go and tweak it but just get something down and connect it and it automatically defaults to the move margin tab. And here you can just easily just drag it. It, it feels very natural when you're using this, this function. And then if there's a little dip like there is right there on the lingual, I click over to the, the add segments tool. And then you just kind of click where somewhere on the, the finish line where you've already marked and then have it be continuous and, and kind of try to make things flow and then click the add segment button again and voila, it kind of fixes any defects like that. I like looking at it at every angle, just making sure that uh, I've accurately told the computer where that tooth ends and where the crown needs to begin. So I'm just kind of spending some time looking at different angles and really tweaking it in. And as soon as I'm happy, uh, one thing I do need to do, I don't know if I did it earlier, I'm gonna check the orientation, just kind of path the draw for the, uh, just for the design software and for the, the milling unit. So I'm just lining it up and looking straight down. Now I'm going to get the plan. I don't spend too much time on the plan tab either. You just kind of want to make the tooth fit uh, in line with the cusp tips and just kind of generally be in the right size, the right, right position. <coughs> Excuse me. Now we're going to go to the design and I'm going to go ahead and click autogenesis off. That's just something that um, you get better proposals when you do that. And the computer does its thing and it automatically kind of puts in a crown. I Off the bat, it always over uh, accentuates the non-functional cusps. I don't know why it does this, but I go ahead and take those down. And <clears throat> I go ahead and take down the buckle cusp too. I'm just kind of using that rubber tooth tool, which is super powerful to dial things in a little bit. And now I'm going to check proximal contacts. And with this, you have a heat map that kind of, you want to aim for that uh, 50 micron to 100 micron kind of range and get that teal kind of almost tropical looking color. 
And that's going to create a really good contact that you don't have to adjust. Um, then I'm going to go and smooth some things out with the smooth tool. It's just kind of double checking, making sure the contours look right. And now we, we need to dial in that occlusion. And so the next step, I'm going to show you a very powerful tool to dial in that occlusion. You can see those cuss tips are just, you know, they're sticking up too much. So I'm going to keep dragging those down with my rubber tooth tool. Checking that bite again. There's a, a really powerful function. It's this uh, modify contact strength. And I just literally can circle. I click that button and I circled them and it automatically kind of brings it down to the right contact. But it doesn't necessarily say that it's in the right spot. So I use this slice tool to really line up that cusp to, um, to FASA relationship. And so I'm dialing that in. And I spend some extra time here doing this because I want to make sure that my patients are going to be able to function with this new crown appropriately. And I'm going through slice by slice, looking at all these contact points. And is it hitting on an incline or is it hitting somewhere where I want them to hit? And I'm using that rubber tooth tool to just slide it in there and, and dial it in. So that's, I, I spend some extra time doing this. Again, I don't want any balancing interferences to introduce. So I kind of like to take those lingual cusps down and out of occlusion. I'm dialing it in more, checking it again without opposing and I'm smoothing things out. And I'm gonna I'm gonna go through and slice it again because this is this is gonna save me a lot of time in the long run if I nail the design now. I'm not gonna have to make adjustments to spend time making adjustments when I'm actually trying this in and delivering it. I'm checking material thickness. That's an important thing too. You want to make sure that you have enough ceramic material and that you're not creating thin spots or or portions of the of the Emacs. Uh, ceramic that are going to be too thin. Triple checking. The more time I spend here, the more time I actually save. So I'm dialing that occlusion in, making sure that those functional cusps are exactly where I want them to hit. And I do spend time double checking, triple checking. It's just kind of what I've done uh, that ensures I'm not going to have to make a bunch of adjustments later. Do my due diligence right here. And then I'm going to do one final look at everything. So I, I like those contact points. I like where it's hitting. And I'm going to look at everything again, material thickness. I'm probably going to check those proximal contacts again. Any spots right there where there's some orange, I kind of want to bulk those spots out on, on the margin. Those proximal point contacts look pretty good. I'm going to kind of add a little bit more to that distal. A little bit more to that mesial. And then we're going to go ahead over to the next tab and we are going to do a simulation. So I'm going to move the sprue to where I need the sprue to be and I'm going to sim what the mill can do. Sometimes what you design and what the mill can actually produce aren't on the same page. So I, I like milling in standard mode if I can, and I'll kind of go into this when I'm talking about the mill. Uh, standard mode will mill it out quicker and it uses a bigger burr. So I, you know, when I'm prepping these teeth, I'm also thinking about that. And if I look, you know, it's, it doesn't have any areas of overmilling. I'm kind of dragging through again. It looks like it has a nice even cement gap. So I know that that restoration is going to fit well and that it's going to mill out nicely and there's not going to be any uh, thin spots produced. So then I go ahead and send it. And I think that that took about six minutes to design. So that's still right there in that wheelhouse of, all right, I didn't spend that much time designing this restoration and you know some some dentists talk about having their assistants design uh, i've tried that before but in the end i end up going back and fixing something and spending more time fixing things so i just rather uh you know i master the design software myself so i'd rather go ahead and design it and i end up saving time so now we're on to the next step of milling these restorations i'm going to talk about this fantastic mill the plan mill 30s it is the most accurate mill that I have ever used. It's a three axis mill. Uh, I know that some labs have five axis mills and they're able to mill into like crazy nooks and crannies and things. And like I said, the three axis mill has some limitations sometimes from the standpoint of over milling or, uh, but you know, 
I've worked with this enough. And when you get one of these, you'll work with it enough that you, you understand, if you understand the design principles, then uh, you know, no limitations here. Uh, it's super, super accurate. I've used the plan mill, the original plan mill, and that was a fantastic mill as well. Uh, but I definitely have noticed once we uh, stepped our game up to the plan mill 30 S that uh, less adjustments, I, I basically make no adjustments and these restorations just fit. Uh, I can't even feel the interface between the restoration and the tooth. Most of the time there's, there's just no gap. There's nothing. Um, posterior restorations take about eight minutes for a premolar, which I think is cooking it with Emacs, uh, to about 15 minutes for those bigger molars. So again, not too much downtime. And, and if you schedule appropriately, like I'd mentioned before, you're able to, to do other things while, while this restoration is milling. Uh, anterior restorations take a little bit more time. Uh, a lot of times you're milling those out in detailed mode just because of the shape of the teeth and, and the occlusion kind of forces you to. And so they take a little bit longer. Uh, but again, 22 minutes is not terrible. And I could still do my two hour appointment with an anterior crown. Another awesome thing and a big step up between the plan mill and the plan mill 30S has been this automated step-by-step -step mill maintenance that it does for you. It automatically tells you when it's time to change the fluid. It's when it's time to, to do any of the maintenance. It, it just kind of blinks at you and tells you it's time. So speaking of mill maintenance, I actually have my assistants do all of this. They kind of keep track of it. And we have a little sheet that uh, makes sure that they're staying on track as well. So we kind of double up there. We not only let the computer tell us, but we also kind of have them check off when they've done it. Something that I do almost every day, if I'm milling three restorations or more, is change that water and clean the tank. Uh, this water, you add a lubricant to it and keeping the machine well lubricated just makes these restorations mill out with no hitches, no problems. Uh, another thing that it's gonna tell you to do is clean the cap. The cap is, uh, it's just, it kind of gets some ceramic material if you're doing a lot of Emacs that will build up. And so you don't want that buildup to, to accumulate too much. And then the third thing that you have to do kind of weekly wise is uh, clean the cap and collet. The collet is the part of uh, the milling unit that holds the burr. And so you don't want this to get dirty again, have debris accumulate because then it's not going to hold the burr completely. And if the burr doesn't see completely, then you could have over or under milling, even if it's a couple microns off. Uh, so keeping these things clean is, is very important, but it's also super easy. And they've done such a good job with this automated kind of, you know, self alerting guidance. It, it's, it's, it's really, really easy. Uh, and it's easy to keep track of. And of course, you're going to have to change burrs. Uh, the burrs wear out. Uh, you do get some good use out of each burr, uh, and it tracks that for you too. It'll track tool breakage. It'll track tool wear. Lets you know how many restorations that uh, specific burr has milled. And then finally, uh, you're going to have to do some type of yearly service on it. So that's you know getting maybe a, a Henry Shine technician to come out. They take off the cover. They open everything up. They look inside, make sure that the inside of the, the milling unit is clean, make sure that the pressure uh, and fluid levels are all, all right where they should be uh, and, and tweak anything that they need to tweak. They, they calibrate it if they have to calibrate it, but that's once a year. Uh, so overall, it's not that much more maintenance uh, and your assistants, they keep track of it. The main thing that we do every day is change that water. If I'm doing more than three units, that I'm changing the water at the end of the day because keeping everything lubricated is super important. So what can you mill out with these mills? Uh, there is a variety of materials you can choose from. And actually on the Plan Mecca website, it has a list you could go through. Here's, here's kind of all the materials that you can purchase to mill with. And if you click on that little plus sign, it will show all of the different shades that each material comes in. For me, one material that I'm going to mention that is, uh, has been pretty cool is Tetric CAD. Uh, it has been a material that I've done some, you know, kind of smaller onlays with. Uh, and it's one thing that I really like about it is that there's no firing stage. So for that emergency patient that came in uh, at three o'clock, you could still do a definitive restoration for them do a conservative small, you know, onlay 
and mill that out and have it delivered. And that's just a nice, you know, production booster for you being able to turn that uh, limited exam over and, and add production as well as a good service to that patient by not, not doing, you know, the gigantic filling, but, but doing a, an onlay and using an indirect method. It's super quick, super easy. You just polish it, uh, follow the manufacturer's protocol for preparing the intaglio surface, go ahead and, and bond it in right away. Uh, they look great. They fit well. They mill out very nicely. Again, limited uh, to, to no adjustments with these. And it is just, if you do have to adjust it, it just just like composite. So for me, I'm, I'm no longer doing big MODBL composites. I'm, if it gets to a certain size beyond an MO or an MOD, uh, I'm, I'm starting to think onlay, and this is a great alternative material. But of course, my favorite material, and the material that I use almost everything, uh, I almost I, I use it for almost everything, is, is Emacs. And it's just, I mean, it's tried and true. It's beautiful. It's strong. It's easy to work with. It just works for this type of CAD CAM workflow. Uh, and it works for those conservative preparation designs that I was, I was mentioning earlier. So if you're using Emacs, how do you make it beautiful? How do you take it from that block and turn it into something that looks lifelike? Kind of what I do, I use the regular Emacs stain and glaze kit that Avaclar provides. And I really get some fantastic, beautiful results. Uh, I haven't dipped into the, the Mio, uh, more advanced staining kit. They have more colors to choose from. And, uh, I, I just haven't ventured there yet. I'm not saying that I won't. Uh, but so far, I've had great success with your standard Emacs kit. Uh, and these are, these are kind of my tools. This is I, I use the object fix flow. Uh, and that kind of secures it on a peg for when I'm firing it. I use the crystal glaze liquid to kind of make things blend. And I just use these crystal stains and I'm, I'm doing a spray glaze. I love that in Nenko spray glaze. It's really, really good. Uh, and so I can have results where I turn, you know, a restoration into a very believable uh, replacement. So this is a patient that came in and needed a crown on, on number eight. Uh, and he wanted everything to blend. He's not looking to have the, you know, perfect white smile. He wants to make that tooth look like all of his other teeth and look like it used to look. And so we're able to do that. And for me, doing this all starts with a good pre-op photo. So I take that pre-op photo and I'll actually send it to my phone. And everyone has a phone. So I'm able to on my phone, I flip it. And then I go ahead and mirror it and zoom in. So now there's number nine, but I have it in the number eight position. So it's oriented the same way that I'm holding my unfired purple phase Emacs. And so side by side, I'm looking. I add the texture that's there, uh, kind of post mill, just to kind of give it a little bit more real lifelike kind of quality to it. And then I go ahead and add the stains where I see them. So the, here's my tooth map. I see some blue. I see some cream. I see those craze lines. I see that one big almost kind of crack in there. You have some darkening at the cervical where he's had recession and there's some cementum showing. Uh, so add the stain. You know, the color that, that you know, there's all different types of colors to choose from this Emacs staining kit. So you just add the, the stain appropriately and you're able to give somebody a restoration, like I said, that looks extremely lifelike. And uh, he, was, he was ecstatic. He actually didn't even know which tooth uh, we had done at the end. Again, he was kind of like, wait, it was this one? Um, and yeah, fantastic, awesome workflow, same day restoration for this patient, customized. You can customize and get as artsy as you want. It just takes practice. So you go ahead and, you know, you added all your stain and you fire it in the lovely CS2 oven or whatever type of uh, programmat oven that you end up purchasing. I don't really dabble in zirconia. So uh, the CS2 is all I need because I, I use Emacs. I don't even really dabble in Empress. Uh, I find that I get uh, the best of both worlds, strength and beauty with uh, lithium disilicate. So then you go ahead and put them in there and fire it. Here's just another case that I've done. Uh, this is not how you really want to 
put your veneers on here. I do suggest actually getting them on the pegs and, and keeping them away because you're probably overheating uh, in this scenario, but they still turned out very well. And again, I added a little bit of stain, a little bit of character to them, and you can create lifelike restorations. And this, this patient, uh, she had some old big composites on uh, eight and nine, and she had kind of a, a fractured tooth on number 10. So I just did three veneers. That's all she really needed. And she was very happy with the, the overall result and said she can now smile again in her pictures. I think, how am I doing? I'm, I'm getting close. So I'm going to kind of speed things up a little bit for this end, but cementation. So you want to go ahead and make sure that whatever materials you're using work, weather, work well together and that you're properly isolating. So I'm going to kind of go forward with, if you're using the materials, you want to use the monobond and scrub for 20 seconds and you want to air water and, and then add the monobond for 20 seconds and let that sit for 40 seconds, then air and water again. And then preparing the tooth, I like doing selective enamel etch. So I'm gonna etch all my enamel for 15 seconds and rinse that off and dry it. And then I'm gonna go ahead and apply my adhesive universal, which I love, it's a fantastic universal bonding agent. And go ahead and air dry that. I air dry that for a little bit longer than 10 seconds. It says 10 seconds, but I do it for more like 20 seconds. Put my uh, light cure on there, add the very link aesthetic and plop that crown on there, clean up the cement, cure it. So that's kind of my protocol, making sure everything's nice and isolated. And if you've ever had to cut one of those off, you know that that's a really good bonding protocol. Uh, just kind of skip through this and it was clinician's report uh, in 2014. It's, it's, it's a really good system and I, I highly recommend it. I've been very ha happy and feel like I've had great success with it. Like I said, cementation protocol is really key to have proper isolation and rubber dam is the best. Uh, there's no way around it. You know, uh, rubber dam isolation is going to, it significantly influences the clinical performance of these materials. So it's, it's going to perform better if you have proper isolation. And I know rubber dams are tough. So I've, I've done isolite and I've done cotton rolls and, and all of that. But as long as you're getting really good isolation, then these materials will do what they do. And these restorations are going to stay in there really well. So again, here's just an onlay that uh, I've done and that this one was with rubber dam isolation. So return on investment, I do wanna to get to this part. Uh, you will get your money back. It's an upfront cost, but it pays for itself and then some. So this is the actual return on investment that I had for the Somerville office. This is a pretty busy office, two docks, uh, averaging you know 26 to 30 units of fixed a month. So single units and, and you know, each stock doing 10 to 15 kind of thing. Uh, with these numbers, Henry Schein and Plan Mecca will take your numbers that you provide them, uh, take the numbers of how much it costs for, they, they take into account all the lab materials, they take into account um, impression material, they take into account temporary material, lab costs, everything. And they kind of throw it all in there. And for Somerville, you know, it paid for itself in a year and the five year, uh, return on investment is $433,000. I mean, you will save and make money by using this system. And you have patients that are super happy. So not only does it make sense financially, but the patients are happier because they don't have to deal with temporaries. And you're happier because on the weekend, you're not getting that phone call that this temporary crown just came off. You have to go into the office. Like you, you just don't have to deal with any of that. And that was pretty awesome for me during the, the pandemic too. I didn't have any crowns to deliver when we had to shut down. I didn't have patients in temporaries. I was, I was pretty confident. Uh, and it, it was nice not having that as, as being something I had to do. Uh, another return on investment is your implant restorations. Uh, I'm going to kind of skip this video, but the true abutment workflow, uh, you take a five or $600 implant crown and you can turn it into $240. Uh, it's fantastic. So here's a case that I did. It's really easy to scan that full art scan. The appointment takes about 15 minutes. They go ahead and make you a custom abutment, give you the design and you can add your standing glaze to make it really blend in. And you have a happy patient with an implant crown that you can't even tell is an implant crown. Uh, it works well for posterior teeth too. Super awesome workflow. The only thing you have to do is you have to actually cement that Emacs crown that you mill out yourself onto that titanium abutment. If you're making it screw retained, the system that I really like using is Panavia V5. 
Uh, it is fantastic and it's super easy to use. They have instructions that kind of uh, dummy proof it. So at this point, uh, I think I'm kind of uh, getting into the question and answer time. So I should probably wrap this up. I'm just going to zoom through these uh, different cases that I have and I'll have to save those for another time. But uh, again, incredible things that you can do with this system. I just don't think I can practice dentistry without it. So again, this is one implant, one veneer, some bleaching and uh, you know, minimal for this patient. I was able to take them from there to there. Uh, again, real life, realistic restorations, doing six units, uh, same day. This is another case I did same day, all one day. So I can't say enough good things about CAD CAM dentistry. I think that it is here to stay. And I think that it is a fantastic service for both you and your patients. So with that, uh, any questions? Yep, I've got one so far. So let's see. There was some active deletion process during one of the scanning videos that you showed. I would yes. like to understand that more. Is that because there's more data points and pressing delete at that point anywhere stitches more accurately? So it's not about uh, stitching more accurately necessarily. It's just about being able to take, uh, let's say you scanned a cheek or you scanned a part of your mirror or like in that, in that scan video, I scanned part of the OptiGate. Uh, you don't want that data to be in there uh, with your final model. Uh, so the active delete is just a button that you can press and you rescan that area without that uh, cheek or without that OptiGate in there and it automatically deletes it. And, and so it just kind of tells the computer, don't include this data. Uh, it's not something that I want to be part of the final model. And it's just as simple as clicking a button on and off while, you, while you're scanning. Can you do zirconia with Plan Mecca? You can. Uh, as far as same day goes, I think they're, they're getting better. It's not the milling time that really takes a lot of time. It's the firing time. Uh, there's no try in phase with the zirconia. So you mill it out and then you have to go straight to the oven. So there's more just like straight downtime for your patient, the milling time and the, the firing time. Uh, I think it's, it takes like 45 minutes for it to fire. So uh, you can do it. Um, if you have one mill, you're going to have to have a separate water tank and I think separate burrs. So just you can purchase an extra water tank. And, um, you know, it's, it's not something that I've really felt the need to use. If I'm, if I'm in a situation where I have a patient that I'm afraid they're going to break my uh, lithium disilicate restoration, then I, you know, I shoot for gold. Uh, I tell them, you know, gold is probably the best on this back molar. Uh, and if they don't really want gold, they want a tooth color, then I'll go with zirconia, but it's just easy. Like that lab workflow that I showed sending it to the lab, it's really easy for me to just export that file, send it to the lab and have the, have the lab make it instead of uh, dealing with any of that. And I know that is two, re two, re uh, two appointments and everything, but it just doesn't, I don't do enough zirconia and I don't do enough of those restorations for it to make sense for me to do that. All right. Well, that's all the questions I have. So we've got a few minutes left. I will leave it up to you if you want to run through one of your cases or if you want to end a little early. Sure. Um, let me see if I go back. This is actually, I'll, I'll show this one. Uh, one thing that's cool about these aesthetic workflows, something that I do is I'll, I'll take a scan with my Emerald S scanner. And from there, I'll be able to do uh, kind of a mock-up. I'll, I'll either... Uh, take the the model and, and 3D print it, or I will digitally kind of, in, in, I've used Mesh Mixer before, there's a bunch of different softwares you can use where you can digitally prep the teeth. And then I'll import that digitally prepped model into my PlanCAD Easy software, and I'll just do a design. So I'll go ahead and do a design without the patient. This is all stuff that I do when the patient's not in the chair. Um, and I go ahead and, and do my design, and I'll get that design 3D printed, and I'll make a putty matrix. Uh, and I, I take that putty matrix and I can transfer that design to the patient's mouth. Uh, I do that even before I prep the teeth a lot of times. And that gives me like a reduction guide so that I know I'm, I'm reducing uh, what's appropriate for, for these restorations. So I'm not over reducing or under reducing. And I'll go ahead and prep everything. And then I'll make another set of temporaries for the patient. Uh, and I'll scan that as the pre-op. I'll scan those temporaries that the patient approves that they really like. I'll scan that as a pre-op. And that's what I did in this case. Uh, and so I scan it and then I go ahead and um, design it. I'll, I'll biocopy. Uh, I'll do a copy 
of the pre-op so that it's super easy for me to go ahead and design this case. So this is me using the, the temporaries that I made after I prepped everything uh, and I just copied and then I fine tuned and dialed in the restorations. Of course, I always see things that I'd rather, I'd, I'd like to change. Like I'm not liking the, uh, the mesial portion, mesial gingival portion of these restorations, but luckily she has a low lip line. And uh, then you go ahead and you can start milling them out one by one. So this patient, uh, I normally, you know, I'll send them out in the temps or this patient wanted to, wanted to take a nap. So she actually slept in my chair for about two and a half hours or three hours while I milled these restorations out because they each took about 22 to 25 minutes. Uh, and I mean, it's a lot of time. So again, I did this on a Friday where there's no hygiene. Uh, I just kind of came in special for this patient and we rocked and rolled and, and provided her a same day smile, uh, with one mil. And it's something that you could do if you work the workflow. And so then she woke up for the purple phase. I tried it in and then I, uh, went ahead and stained and, and added my characterization. So I had a little gray, I had a little, uh, incisal translucency, a little cervical staining. And then uh, added some texture. I kind of, you know, sometimes I'll do the spray glaze, but it might be too shiny. So then I have some some lab uh, ceramic polishing bears that I'll kind of tone them down or add some uh, add, add a little bit of matte finish to them or anything like that. And um, voila, she she left same day and uh, she was ecstatic because then she finally felt like she could smile again. Uh, so yeah, super powerful. Uh, absolutely love this this system and it makes sense if you want to get into CAD cam dentistry uh, this is a very very good system great return on investment and very powerful very powerful awesome well with that we will wrap for the day so thank you dr bennett for the great presentation and of course thank, thank you, you to plan mecca for sponsoring this webinar if anyone has additional questions about cad cam technology and or adding it into your practice please feel free to email us at webinars at henryshine.com and we'll be more than happy to connect you with a sales rep in your area additionally for more henry shine webinars visit henryshinedental.com webinars for our upcoming schedule Everyone will receive the recording of this webinar via email sometime in the next week. So look out for that. Thanks for joining us and have a great weekend. Thank you.